This conference will now be recorded. So, uh, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is uh, Hasiba Hamzi and uh, from Algeria and I am a team member of Yalda Publicity and Communications Department and uh, today I will be moder moderating uh, this webinar. Um, before going uh, into the details, uh, I would like to uh, to remind you of some housekeeping rules, um, which are uh, when you enter the webinar, make sure you are on a mute. Remain on mute throughout the webinar. Ensure your camera is off. Type your questions or comments in the chat box only. Put your name and country. Those whose questions or comments are selected will be asked to unmute and speak. If you are asked to speak, you must introduce yourself by name and the country only, please, and then repeat the question or comment you typed in the chat box. So um, now to the introduction. Uh, can you please... Um, Okay, so uh, before going to the introduction, uh, today's, um, today we're going to deal with uh, a theme which is uh, transforming food systems, youth innovation for human and planetary health. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, for the introduction, um, just a second. Okay, so for the introduction, uh, dysfunctional food systems have plunged many countries in Africa into chronic famine and poverty. Citizens find themselves in desperate conditions, deprived of basic needs. COVID-19 further worsened the plight, adding to the strains of the already problematic food systems. By disrupting markets and supply chains for small-scale farmers, COVID-19 threatens peace and stability, particularly among the most vulnerable and marginalized populations. SDG2 and MDG1, towards a zero hunger global community, appear elusive as an increasing number of people suffer from hunger, forcing many to flee their homes, which itself further impedes production and integrated effort from both foreign and domestic donors supports individuals in these areas. Sadly, the limited reach and the unsustainability of such short-term support structures leaves the future in a dire need of other solutions. Advocates have grappled to implement long-term forward-looking projects, particularly ones that incorporate youth into their mainstream action plans. Our current food production methods are also inadequate in relation with SDG 12 towards sustainable consumption and production. Worldwide farming utilizes more than two thirds of all fresh water resources and the overusage of fertilizers in most of the regions of Africa has led to dead zones in areas and to the defertilization of former food producing land. As rightly conveyed by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the UN, youth must be put at the center of the food sector for a substantial change to take effect. The youth should not be seen as recipients or targets only, but as fundamental contributors and partners towards the identification of a new and innovative solutions and its consequent and its consequent implementation for the promotion of a better agriculture, sustainable value change for, change for our planet, uh, and healthy lifestyles. Further in on this point, UN Secretary General Special Envoy to the 2021 Food System Summit, Dr. Agnes Kalibatama, conquered that we cannot implement the science without also addressing questions of access, equality and finance, and we cannot build a better future for tomorrow without including the youth of today. 
Um, so uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time to show up and uh, uh, come to join us in this um, powerful discussion. And also, I would like to thank our uh, dear uh, panelists for making the time to uh, come and share their knowledge and expertise. So welcome again, everyone. Uh, so uh, just to introduce uh, our speakers, we have we have um, we have uh, Mr. Augustine. Um, we have Mr. Augustine Sanzi Bangura, who is the co-founder CEO Sierra Agrifoods. We have uh, also uh, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth Kulugulu Machache, who is the environmental scientist and climate change activist. We have also uh, Mr. Um, uh, Ulumide uh, Idao, who is the co-founder CEO uh, ICCDL Africa. And uh, we have also uh, Ms. Blaine Tesfaye, who is the co-founder True Love Granola. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Herman Estosu, who is Agricultural Economist Program Officer, International Fund for Agricultural uh, Development, IFAD. So, um, welcome again, uh, our dear uh, speakers. So, um, Thank you again, distinguished speakers. So today, the first question to all of you is the following. What does sustainable production and conception mean? What do you see as the biggest obstacle to a sustainable food system in the future? With an increasing number of people suffering from hunger, what is the long-term solution to make it possible to end hunger globally? And uh, how can we incorporate youth into the uh, solution? So um, uh, I would like to uh, remember uh, the speakers that you have only five minutes uh, to answer to uh, this uh, question or any part of this uh, question. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's get started with Mr. Augustine. Mr. Augustine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Okay, I think he's not he's not here. So, um, okay, I'm going to uh, ask uh, direct this question to uh, Miss uh, Elizabeth Gulugulu Machache. Miss Elizabeth, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the platform. I hope I'm audible enough. I'm going to ask if you can share the questions on the screen again so that um, I don't miss and I also try to stick to time. So, yes, sure. uh, yes, sure. OK, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I'm Elizabeth Kuligulu from Zimbabwe, an environmentalist. I work with an organization called the African Youth Initiative on Climate Change. And also, I call it the Agriculture Working Group and uh, the Children and Youth Constituency to the UNFCCC. So whilst I'm waiting for the questions to be shared, I'm not yet seeing them on the screen, but um, I believe one of the questions was, uh, what is the definition of uh, sustainable food systems? And as you have uh, rightfully indicated that um, uh, our population is increasing and uh, the FAO projects that up to 20, by 2050, uh, our population will be approximately uh, 10 billion people and it means that we need more food because the higher the population the more the food we will need but how are we going to manufacture how are we going to produce this food so that uh, the increased population can actually get to consume food more sustainably right so this is simple um we need to go back to the basics if we are talking about sustainable food systems we are talking about food systems that respect our natural environment 
if we are producing our food systems, are we in are we respecting the environment that is surrounding that particular area? We have seen quite a number of farming initiatives, quite a number of projects that have been happening, but massive and intensive farming, which has led to, uh, to land degradation, soil erosion, contributing to climate change. If we do not have planetary health, we do not have food systems. The two are interlinked. We cannot separate them. Food systems should also be um, in favor and also pay particular attention to indigenous communities as well. If you're talking about food systems, are the food systems attainable? Are they available? Are they accessible? This is what we are talking about. A sustainable food systems ensure that there is food security. If there is food insecurity, then it, we cannot call it sustainable. I'm sure we have learned a lot by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It has exposed our food systems and we have seen that our food systems were severely affected. I'm talking about transportation, transporting food from point A to point B. That was a major challenge. Accessing the food because there is no food. We cannot transport the food because people are on a lockdown. It means that we cannot access the food. We had a problem with food uh, diversity. You could not choose the kind of food you would want to eat. Uh, meaning that it was actually a problem, exposing how uh, unsustainable our food systems are. So this is what I understand about, you know, about food systems. And even if the population is growing, we are capable, we can still come up with sustainable food systems in a growing population using different kinds of initiatives, which I will talk about later. I will not talk about them now because I wouldn't want to preempt other people's uh, presentations. But above all things, what I would want to say is let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to the basics. I remember when I was growing up, my mom would my mom would encourage us and my sisters to go to a nearby farm, we would walk five kilometers just to collect um, cow dung, which we would put in our gardens. I mean, it was quite easy for her to go and buy fertilizer but because it wasn't sustainable. And we cannot start talking about sustainable food systems without considering how we are growing the food. What are we putting into the crops for, in order for them to grow? What are we putting into our soils in order for them to produce good foods? So this is quite important. We need to go back to the basics. Uh, we need to accommodate indigenous knowledge systems. We also need to, uh, we also need to consolidate our indigenous knowledge systems with the scientific research that we are getting. That you know what, uh, we are getting approximately 7% of our greenhouse gas emissions from food waste. We are getting approximately 24% of our greenhouse gas from you know, the agricultural sector. Those statistics alone, they help us to come up with robust policies that can um, create sustainable food system, be it our local food system, regional food system, or our global food systems. So without wasting much, I will leave the rest to my colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, dear Elizabeth uh, Machache, for your uh, insightful remarks and uh, comments. Um, so uh, now um, I would love to uh, move to Mr. Uh, Herman Tosu to answer to this question. Mr. Herman Tosu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Asiba. Uh, I am Herman Tosu, uh, Agric Economics, working for the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Uh, I will be more quick and uh, build on what Elizabeth already said about sustainable production and food consumption. Uh, to me, sustainable production uh, means do what we have to do to feed the population without destroying the environment at all level and all stage. And when we said sustainable production, it starts from the pre-production step. How do we manage our land? How do we ensure that the fertilizer that we use does not destroy yeah. the environment? How do we ensure that any action that we put yeah, before starting production, so someone is interrupting? May I continue now? Please, uh, the speakers, please, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. 
Sorry, Herman. If you are not speak, if you are not speaking, please mute yourself. And um, speakers, if you can use your video, um, use your video. If not, we have your picture on a slide. So feel free to do whatever. So you can use your video or the picture on the slide. Um, we will just navigate. If we see your video on, then we'll we'll remove the slide. Thank you. Okay, so I can continue. So sustainable production, many people look at the production and post-harvest sites, but it starts from the pre-production. What we put in pre-production is fertilizer, inputs. What are we providing to people that feed us to ensure that no matter what they do with the seeds we provide does not destroy environment. When you, you introduce different agents in a rural area, for example, even you have the best productivity, it doesn't mean that in the next 50 years, the soil you use, the water you use will be there and you can continue to use them. To me, we need to look at this side. And now when we look at the consumption, it's everywhere and even in our house, we are not sure that we cannot eat our meal, but we order it and we, we, we throw it away while people around us need that food. Consumption also need, means that we need to consume smarter. Do not produce what you, you need and do not exchange or trade what is not useful for the environment and for people around us. The, the biggest obstacle to sustainable future in the future when we take the African region start with peace. Over the past two decades we see that there is more danger in rural area. People are leaving this area that feed us to move in the city and even the danger is coming to the city. Without peace even we have the best system, the best model to feed the world, the best uh, input, we cannot ensure that our food system will be sustainable. And another thing is the growing youth population in Africa. For now, sorry for the word, for now, we youth are just a number. When you see how uh, dialogue is going, how people talk, norm seems that, that, okay, these people are just number on the paper. How do we ensure that this growing population, our generation and the coming generation, learn more about to respect environment, respect, have a smart way of consumption and behave well vis-a-vis -vis our environment and the world. And uh, I will leave uh, the floor to, uh, to Nestep to respond to how we can incorporate you into the solution. But for the long term, if you want to uh, increase, decrease the number of people suffering of hunger, we have to invest in restoration of soil, sustainable management of land, create assets for young people, uh, uh, look at the nutrition side and also ensure that smallholder farmers has, have good access to market and sell their product at a good price. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Herman, for your uh, brilliant uh, remarks and, uh, and comments. Uh, I agree with you with the uh, with the, one of the points, which is like uh, we need uh, the, the population uh, needs to learn. Like the key of the success is uh, education in order uh, to respect the environment. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tosu. Um, uh, please, uh, Miss. Um, Ms. Tesfai, what do you think about uh, the question that I have posed? Ms. Blaine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Viva. Um, and thank you all for being a part of this conversation. So just as some context, I'm CEO of True Love Granola, and True Love produces healthy foods made with ingredients we aim to sustainably source from local food. Um, so I think sustainable production means providing incomes and creating jobs, including vulnerable communities in the production and as consumers, reducing levels of hunger and malnutrition, safeguarding water, soil, air quality, 
and minimizing greenhouse gas emissions and food loss and waste. So that's the production side. On the consumption side, sustainable consumption essentially protects public health, the planet, and our climate. And it includes the consumption of safe and nutritious food, you know, reducing consumption of sugar, oil, meat, dairy, and increased consumption of fruits and vegetables. And excuse me if it's a little loud in the background, I'm at an airport right now. Um, so those, those are how I would define those two elements of sustainable production and consumption. So thinking through the lens of what we do as a healthy foods producer, you know, we will do things like partner with farmer groups and unions to provide them with guaranteed offtake for their produce to ensure it doesn't go to waste. Um, like someone mentioned earlier, food waste is a huge co contributor to um, greenhouse gas, gas emissions, is really harmful to the environment, and is a huge element of the problem of the food gap. So, you know, when we partner with smallholder farmer groups, we in increase their income, we give them the resources to increase their storage capacity and mechani mechanization, which ensures that folks are not um, having their crops and their harvest go to waste. We're also on a journey of developing products that are plant-based and more broadly advocating for a more plant-based diet that also fills consumers' nutritional needs, which is important because of the disproportionate negative impact that beef production has on the environment. And then we also look at creating products that counter trends, at least in Ethiopia, towards low cost, unhealthy processed foods by creating affordable, convenient options made with local whole foods and that are minimally processed. So I'm just sharing with you a few of the small steps that we're taking as a very small business. Small businesses manage at least half of our global food economies and we need support i think if we learned anything from the covid 19 pandemic it's it's that we need support and we need support from governments ngos funders retailers food industry and larger food manufacturers because it's only together that we can kind of reorient towards a more functioning and sustainable food system so this will require shifts in food production and consumption and it will require full engagement of all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tesfai, for uh, your answer. And um, and uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to remind um, uh, our um, speakers uh, and uh, our audience that um, that please, uh, when uh, you you type your comment or questions. Uh, drop them uh, on the chat box and mention uh, your name and your country. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, now we have, uh, we go into the specific uh, questions uh, directed to our um, esteemed uh, panelists. Um, so, okay. And, and now we're going, as I said, to uh, the specific uh, questions based on our uh, uh, based on our speaker's uh, background. So um, my first question is going to be directed uh, to Miss uh, to Mr. Um, to Mr. Um, To Mr. Herman uh, Tuso. Um, sorry, um, just once. Hasiba, is Mr. Augustine on? I heard Mr. Augustine is now here with us. Oh, really? Okay. Naida, so, um, what? Here, Augustine? Naida, is Augustine here with us? No, he isn't. Pardon? He isn't. He isn't yet. Okay. All right. No. Go ahead, Hasiba. Okay. Thank. Thank you. So. Um, 
Go ahead with Miss Elizabeth's question on the screen. Yes. And just. Um, okay. So, uh, what, Miss uh, Elizabeth, uh, please, uh, what are the best agricultural options for increasing food production while simultaneously? while simultaneously reducing contributions to climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. The floor is yours, Ms. Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much for the I question. I can repeat the question if... Yes, sure. I, I think I got it. I think I got it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for the question. So we need to understand that um, the cause of I think the cause of you know a lot of deaths uh, is contributed by poor diets or by malnutrition. And I think according to the Global Nutrition Report of 2020, it states that eight million deaths per year are accounted to poor nutrition. Now, what causes poor nutrition? So I need to talk about a few things. That of course we understand that our population is growing. But at the same time, we need to eat. At the same time, we need the energy to do our things. But however, like I said in my opening remarks, we can still produce more food in a more sustainable manner. So I'm going to briefly highlight on a few concepts that we can use uh, as we are trying to attain food security in our respective countries. Number one, which is climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture will focus on the three pillars. The three pillars of climate smart agriculture includes climate change mitigation, because we also acknowledge that the agriculture sector globally is contributing to a huge chunk to greenhouse gas emissions. I'm talking about 22% of our greenhouse gas emissions, they are from the agriculture sector, specifically livestock through enteric fermentation and manure management. Of course, we have some gases that will come from uh, biomass burning, veld fires, ETC, but the huge chunk will come from enteric fermentation. We need to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions through the way we practice our agriculture, even the chemicals that we use, even the machineries that we use in the field, we need to make sure that they are in support of our food systems. Then number two, the second pillar of climate smart agriculture will look at how communities or how farmers are capable to adapt in a changing environment. Because climate change is real, floods are there, heat waves are there, droughts are there, we cannot deny that fact. But as all those things are happening, we need to understand that we can try to adapt to these effects. How can we adapt? I'm, I'm in the southern part of Africa, and according to the recently launched IPCC report, indicates that the effects of climate change and hazards are going to continue. We are going to have massive floods, we are going to have droughts, we are going to have heat waves, you can name it. But at the end of the day, we need to adapt. And we cannot start talking about food security without talking about water security. So by adapting, we are saying that we can come up with you know, uh, water harvesting techniques. We can either diversify our crops if we used to grow maize in that specific area. And if we have realized that it is not growing well because of the shifts of seasons, then we can divert and maybe opt for drought tolerant crops that will do well in that area. I can name quite a number of adaptation measures that we can use, but I, since I need to make sure that I do not, um, I, I, I'm within time. Then the third pillar of climate smart agriculture will look at um, making sure that we are ensuring food security. After we have mitigated, after we have adapted, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that our communities are secure when it comes to food. And I talked about how we can say, if we are talking about food security, we're looking at how accessible the food is, um, how available the food is, how attainable the food is, you can name it. So all these components, they, 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 they will make up what we are referring to as food security. If the food is not available, then we cannot say we are food secure. If the food is not attainable, we cannot say the food is secure as well. Then other methods that we can look at is regenerative agriculture. I talked about how we should consider what we are putting into our soils. 
everything for it to grow, it starts from the soil. How are we treating our soils? How fertile are our soils? How rich are our soils? And the importance of farmers to do, you know, consistent uh, soil tests in order for them to know if their soils are in good condition. That is of paramount importance. And what are we putting into our soils? That is also very important. Remember, we have a thousand of soil organisms uh, little soil organisms, the little small species that we don't know, but they also assist in shaping up our food system. If we put something that is dangerous to the soil, that is harmful to the environment, then we are not saying we. Then we cannot say our foods are. are, are we cannot talk about food sustainable food systems. We cannot talk about food security because we are killing the planet that will produce the food for us. So we really have to be important when it comes to regenerative agriculture. Let's try to use organic things. Uh, this will also help, even the quality of our food will also be better. Then I will just try to summarize, considering that I'm only left with approximately one and a half minutes, on the importance of agroecological practices. Agroecological practices, which is the integration of our indigenous knowledge system and the scientific evidence. Agroecological practices will focus on 10 pillars, which I will not explain, but I will just highlight on the most important pillars of agroecological practices, which is uh, some of the pillars are to make sure that communities are also food secure. And one of the pillars also looks at partnerships within, within farmers, there is need for partnership. I'm sure the previous speaker mentioned about partnership. How is the private sector seeing the farmers? And also one of the pillars will focus on issues to do with labor. Most of the time we are saying young people, they are not interested in farming. Young people, they are not seeing the opportunities that are there. But at times, look at the labor that is there. Is it conducive for young people to be part of it before we start saying young people are not interested in this? So it looks at quite a number of things and it also looks at food diversity, incorporating even the food that our grand grandparents used to eat, which consists or incorporate or which can be part of a sustainable food system. So these are the things that we can all practice that can make sure that we can ensure food security at the same time reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Last but not least, it is quite important for us to understand that after we have done our harvest, after we have um, harvested our produce, food waste can actually go back. You know, it can be go back and it can act as organic manure. We cannot leave food waste for it to, you know, for it to contribute to more greenhouse gas emissions. Eight percent, it's a huge percent. Uh, of greenhouse gas emissions accumulating in the atmosphere, this food waste it can go back to the to the food chain, go back to the fields, and it actually you know helps the quality. It actually helps our soils to be fatter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Miss uh, Elizabeth uh, Machache, for sharing with us uh, your uh, insightful uh, remarks and uh, uh, the steps that we need uh, to follow as uh, in order to have uh, food uh, security in, in our um, in our uh, planet. Uh, so now, uh, without further ado, I would like to. Uh, direct my question to Ms. Blaine, and I would like to remind our uh, speakers and our uh, dear participants that uh, you have only five minutes to answer uh, these specific questions directly to you. Thank you so much. The floor is yours, Ms. Uh, Blaine. Thank you. And um, the, the question which I want to uh, ask is, uh, uh, what is the potential contribution of localized food production to the overall sustainability of food systems? And uh, what do you think, Ms. Blaine, uh, the youth uh, have to do uh, to become uh, more, uh, to become an innovative food entrepreneurs like yourself? Thank you, Ms. Blaine, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So. True Love is very much invested in the idea of local food production. So we source all of our agricultural inputs from within Ethiopia and are really proud to do so. Um, that said, sometimes we see the word local and take it as shorthand for sustainable and also as shorthand for short supply chain. Um, local production really just refers to production that takes place within a specified geography, whereas short supply chain refers to supply chains that involve a limited number of economic operators. 
So in True Love's case, an important motivation for our local sourcing is our desire to support smallholder farmers to increase their incomes and allow more stability to the work they do. However, to have the impact that we want to have, we have to make sure that that sourcing is not only local, but also has a su short supply chain so that we're buying directly from smallholder farmers rather than having the income from our purchase spread over a number of intermediaries. Um, also, when we look at local food production, we've got to take it case by case and consider transportation. So, you know, things like cargo ships or trains that really do long distance kind of transportation can be relatively less polluting over long distances than trucks over small distances. Um, we also have to consider can local food systems produce enough food to meet local demand without causing environmental stress through the use of fertilizers and converting natural land for crop use. So there may be foods that are best produced non-locally to consider um, the environment. Also considering diversifying food supply via trade um, might strengthen the food security and resilience of a community. Um, so there has to be a balance that's struck between relying on local food production and a suitable diversified trade in food products. Um, so, I mean, all of that said, in our case, we do source locally and it's important to us because it is a very specific case in which we have looked at the benefits and the impacts and we see that there's a strong benefit to be gained from the smallholder farmers in terms of the improvement of their livelihoods. As for the second question, I would encourage youth to start their work in their own communities. So places where they can look closely at the way local food systems operate and evaluate, what, evaluate what's working well, what's not from all angles, especially through the lenses of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Um, so they would want to think about things like what would be the impacts if the trends continue as they are now? What would a better future in the food system look like? And then ask, what do I think I can do to make progress for this change? And how do I balance environmental, social, and economic factors at play? Lastly, um, but most importantly, I would recommend they give their ideas a try, even in small ways, and watch what happens. Did it work? Were there adverse outcomes? And take these learnings and adjust, and just keep doing that over and over. Um, and that is essentially the mindset of an entrepreneur, to constantly take learnings, which can often look and feel like failures, and do better next time. And I think as food sustainability entrepreneurs, we do have that motivation and drive to do better, not just for ourselves, but for our communities and for the planet. So that would be my advice to young entrepreneurs seeking to innovate in the food industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Blaine, for your uh, wonderful uh, remarks and comments. Of course, I do agree with you that um, uh, you, the, the, the youth, or we have to uh, try over and over and again in order to get success. Like even if you fail uh, once, but you don't have to give up. So thank you very much, Ms. Blaine, for your uh, advices. And now. Um, I would uh, go with uh, Mr. Uh, Herman. So, uh, Mr. Herman, uh, please, what type and combinations of technologies, farming practices, and policies will result in the maintenance of the ecosystem in agricultural systems undergoing intensification in developing countries, most importantly in Africa? Thank you, Mr. Herman. The floor is yours. You have only five minutes to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will start with the, the farming system. Uh, in the recent year, we see that there is a new trend to consider indigenous knowledge, uh, even past practice that we have in the soil to regenerate land and other things. This trend shows that for years we have been doing wrong towards environment but what also the food system itself if we consider that so farming system yes uh i will not say that it's only climate smart agriculture but localized farming system 
we need to re to put again the farmers, smallholder farmers, at the center of everything that we do to ensure that the ecosystem is sustainable over the year and for the next generation. If we take example for the, the fertilizer side, there are many industries in West Africa and even in Africa producing fertilizer that can help farmers. But when you look at the fertilizer and even seeds markets, we have so many non-authorized products that farmers are using on the fields. People that uh, think that are dangerous for the environment, non-approved, and even dangerous for our health. So how do we ensure that when we want to support farmers, when we train them, when we give them financial support to farm, how do we ensure that the product that they buy to plant or to breed the animal is not dangerous for them, is not dangerous for our health? That's the first thing. The other side is the technology. We cannot continue to produce the same way with just plots and other things. On the same side, we cannot leave smallholder farmers behind and just say that we are going to industry. So there is a need to, to do a good means. Good means means there are small equipment that can ease life of farmers that we can use and exist already in the continent. We need to promote such uh, investment, we need to invest more in such technology and ensure that farmers don't don't spend like five hours in one hectare in, while he can spend like 30 minutes. Time, we need to, to, to gain time, use technology that save time, sorry, that save time, that save money and even allow young people to go to school. Uh, another thing that is doing Bricks now is the digital transformation. There are myriad of innovation. When you look only at ECOWAS region, there are myriad of innovation towards agricultural sectors. But all these efforts are not coordinated at all. You can see the same do different donor investing in the same activities in the same area with the same people sometimes without knowing that they are putting double money to the same people. How do we coordinate that to ensure that donors do not spend money in digital transformation like it is done 50 years ago? Because to, if you look at closely now, it is the way it is going. Another thing in the digital transformation is we have many applications that have been designed by youth, but without support, it stopped at the ideation. And even when it goes beyond this ideation or the prototype page, there's one thing that stop the, 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 the trends is that the application does not match the market's needs. How do we ensure that all applications that have been designed by youth can meet a market needs instead of creating a new one? Uh, so about technology and farming system, I would say that policy, uh, policy, the thing is that we have good policy uh, already in the country, but how do we implement it? Do we implement that policy is the issue. You, when you look at the policy for the region, ECOWAS, uh, SADEC and and, other, and even EAU, many efforts have been put and even money, but those policy suffer because youth are not at the center when it comes to implementation. As youth, we cannot wait those, uh, the, the policy maker to implement things for ourselves. Today, we, we just see youth in politics, but not in civil society action. How do we advocate ourselves? How do we advocate for, to, to be sure that these people knows well what we want in the field? So policy, yes, we have policy, but the, the thing is we really need to work more on our level. 
And to finish, if you allow me a few minutes, to finish is the the training, technical yes. and vocational training to youth, to, to young people. We train them and many training programs stop at the training level. It's not useful if you train someone and leave him without the necessary means to implement what you, you taught him. So policy for TVETs and even program projects should not stop only at training them put them in contact with a bank, but it should go beyond that and even uh, support them, at least for the first year, to ensure that these young people uh, start doing well the thing and ensure the, their contribution to the development and even our food system. Over. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Mr. Uh, Tosu, for your uh, uh, remark and for your uh, suggestions. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the policies uh, should be uh, implemented uh, as well. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Tosu. And now uh, I'm going uh, to uh, ask my question to Mr. Augustine. And I would like to remind our uh, speakers and our uh, dear um, audience that uh, for the specific questions you have only five minutes to uh, answer to it. Thank you uh, Mr. Augustine. Uh, now uh, the question is the following is uh, with sustainable food production becoming so necessary to our environment what do you think is the best way to make production sustainable and how can these methods be implemented in the African countries? Thank you very much, Mr. Augustine, and welcome among us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good day, everybody. Um, it's indeed a honor to share this platform and thanks to the organizers. Um, to start with, I need to mention that um, today's youth population is the greatest in history and this in itself is a very huge um, dividend for the African continent and so all that is needed is for us to leverage this as an opportunity to ensure we do not only promote um, the transformation of food systems but we promote a transformation of food systems that is sustainable and that can work in the best interest in terms of helping to um, 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 build Africa's economic um, status. Uh, now, talking on the area of sustainability and the role of young people, um, I would say agricultural production for me um, in Africa, we are blessed in the area of um, getting rains and um, having the soil. So these themselves are one of the greatest dividends we have as a continent that we can leverage. Um, about 60% of the African, um, uh, um, in Africa, of the soil we have is arable for agriculture. This is a huge natural resource you cannot find elsewhere in the globe. The, the water, the rainwater, the availability of water is in itself very, very great. But um, the question is, how can we adopt models like that adopted by Egyptians? Egypt is an African country. It is a country that is not blessed with having rains, but yet they we are able to leverage the river Nile as a key resource. They introduced the basin irrigation. So if we are serious about promoting sustainable agriculture and a food system that is sustainable, then we have to see how best we can leverage technologies to ensure irrigation it takes a very new toll in terms of agricultural production because no single farmer or agribusiness person can invest in agriculture sustainably without having adequate water. The land is always there. All we need is a technology to leverage on this technology to ensure that um, we have year-round production. And so for me, this is why to some extent, I think that yes, in as much as we don't have the technological strength as an African co continent, we have to leverage into other countries. There is a need for the political will to always create the requisite platform for Africa to encourage um, man man um, industrial manufacturing of the re relevant technologies and machineries needed to support irrigation. And then um, 
the area of um, cross-border taxes and customs. Imagine I'm a farmer in Sierra Leone. If I need to um, export, say, um, an irrigation machine from Kenya, now they, 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 they leverage an innovation that is um, very, very wonderful. Maybe an irrigation machine may cost me $1,500. But by the time I bring them here in Sierra Leone, I will have spent double that money. So what if I need 10 or 20 machines to support my farm? And then access to finance is a whole lot of issue that we can leave as a, a topic for another day. And so for me, the African continental free trade area is also very integral. Because an integrated market on the African continent will be beneficial to Africa's 1.2 billion population. And so therefore, all of us are placing our hopes on this particular agreement with the hope that Africa can double its intracontinental trade by 2025 and see 100 million Africans lifted out of poverty by 2025. We just have few years down the line. The indicators are not welcoming. And so therefore, um, if we want to be serious about this, the technologies, the tax impositions, they have to be looked into. And this is why the political will is very critical. And irrigation, the soil are fertile, they are irrigable for agriculture. The challenge has remained with water. And so we have to um, um, really consider this um, when we talk about promoting um, the transformation of sustainable um, food systems on the global stage, particularly relating to the African continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Augustine, for your um, uh, for your remarks and uh, suggestions. Of course, like uh, as you have said, um, the one of the solutions uh, would be to consider uh, is uh, considering uh, promoting uh, in order to transform our uh, food systems. And um, we have to, as you have said, we have to encourage uh, industrial uh, manufacturers. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Augustine. Um, uh, without um, uh, now, um, I would like to uh, remind uh, our dear um, speakers that um, and our dear uh, audience that please uh, type your questions uh, in the chat box uh, when uh, you are typing your questions do not forget to mention your name and your country and uh, please uh, if you are asked to do so please unmute uh, yourself and uh, ask your question directly or uh, we're going to read uh, them so thank you um, Okay, uh, now uh, we're going to. Um, okay, just a second, please. Um, okay. Now uh, we're going to the uh, uh, Q and A uh, session. So I can see that. Um, Okay, so I can see that um, uh, <clears throat> just a second, please. Okay, so we have uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Mr. Uh, Pascal uh, Onyango from Kenya, uh, who is asking uh, about the measures. Uh, he is saying that uh, he's asking for the, what are the measures that are in place in order to ensure, in order to ensure food security in Africa for adequate food for Africa during pandemics like uh, displacement, floods, uh, etc. So that's his question, and uh, perhaps, um, okay, 
Uh, perhaps uh, one of the speakers would like to uh, answer this question. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Mr. Tosu, perhaps would like to answer this question or just make a small comment about this question. Uh, Thank you. I will. I will, I will be. Thank you, Asiba. Uh, I will make a small comment. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, the question is first the COVID when we, we, we see the COVID 19 pandemic, uh, few of us was, could predict that this will happen to us since three years now, if we can say. And when it happened, you, you, we see that many institutions, even national governments, put in place urgent mechanisms to support population and even people in rural areas. Uh, for example, we see that if I may say uh, World Bank, IFAD, FAO, national government, uh, bilateral cooperation, and even private sector actor uh, develop mechanisms to support asset and livelihood of young people. I know that especially for the side region. You see, this support is not enough when we look at the needs of the fields. We can invest more, but we need to prepare for the nests. And preparing for the nests is to take strong action, strong action, not only at the coming food system summit, but ensure that action that we pro that political policy maker decide at this summit is translated really into livelihood of smallholder farmers in rural areas and even for urban agricultural producer. If we take example of the promise that was made during the COP21 in Paris, till now, we are still struggling to get, to get that promise. Why climate change is showing us that we are not doing sustainable practice every day. The floods, the drought that we are seeing today is not just the results of one decade. And it's not getting better. So how do we ensure that the promise is realized? We youth have a great role to play to ensure that. We have network, at least for those who are educated or goes to, went to school, we have network. Can we leverage our network to ensure that the promise is real on the field? That's a question to all of us. And I would finish to say that we do not, we should not wait only the measure to ensure food security. Food security starts in our house. Even we cannot grow big farm in our house, you take old tire, I I'm talking about urban agriculture, you take old tire, you put some land inside, you try to learn how to plot something, you are contributing slowly but surely to food security for all, all of us. Thank you. Yes, um, can, I, can I come in with this question? Uh, yes, sure, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think I may limit my answer to um, the question asked by the gentleman um, to three recommendations. If we are really serious about promoting food security, particularly in terms of crisis, and um, one of these has to do, do um, with um, protecting food supply chain and then consider them as essential services. You know, while lockdown the locking down the population may be an adequate measure and we hear that many governments you know have been imposing curfews among other measures food supply chain for me should be considered 
as an essential service is just like health, pharmacies, banking, etc. Yeah. You know, many governments in other parts of the world have been doing this, and countries in Africa could learn from this action. If borders are closed, government should allow for essential goods and businesses, including the movement of food, to continue. You cannot allow the movement of medicines as essential service to continue and then leave food outside. When in essence, it is a very first medicine that the human person needs. And then secondly, is to consider fiscal and monetary incentives. You know, government should consider also um, setting up incentives, such as lifting the VAT duties and other taxes imposed on food businesses, so as to enable them, the supply chain, to continue to function properly without interruptions. And this should also consider extending consensual loans or loan guarantee facilities to food actors who may, not, who may need to ensure that the food supply chain is running smoothly, even in moments of crisis. You know, some um, um, countries in Africa actually um, um, are already considering this, like Zambia, measures like this. You know, to the extent practicable, restaurants and food shops should be allowed to continue to operate where they can maintain physical distancing requirements and um, explore alternative delivery systems. And then um, another the third, thirdly, is to use food reserves wisely and target said um, 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 and target appropriately. You know, many governments hold grain and other food reserves. They should they should ensure these reserves are monitored. They monitor the prices and release from um, food uh, from the food reserve banks. And in the addition, government should also not hesitate to distribute request assistance from businesses or international or national organizations to distribute food to those in need, appropriately targeting um, 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 the groups that actually deserve it and not doing so based on political um, 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 lines. You know, and to keep markets also open while ensuring safety, like I mentioned earlier. Um, see how best we can also leverage technologies. Social media is there, and then we have to this population, youth population, being active users of the social media, give the, the platform for food and businesses to thrive even in moments of crisis during lockdowns, but that others are collected, just like we do in my company. We ensure that even during the lockdown, for example, we have the potato bread that we manufacture. We ensure we receive orders from WhatsApp, from Facebook, from Instagram, from our customers. So even when they need nutritious bread to eat in the morning, they will just put their order overnight, collect their orders. We have a team of staff that we trained. We ensure they follow all precautionary measures. So we do the delivery for them at home. We bring spies. What other way can um, abusers be so loyal to its customers than taking going the extra mile to even put your life at risk. So technology is also very, very key. So I think this is it for now. And um, of course, on the ground level has to do with um, the area of um, supporting farmers with incentives to ensure um, um, they, 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 they boost the um, their agricultural production and productivity levels. Because it's very critical, especially with smallholder farmers. They, they produce up to 70% of the food we consume in the African continent. So they are very integral, boosting them, providing incentives for them, providing farm inputs and other technological support for them is very critical to ensure we have um, sufficient food reserves, you know, in terms of whole grains, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Augustine, for your, uh, for your insights. And uh, yes, uh, we have to, uh, as you have said, we have, you, we have to leverage uh, technology and we have to uh, encourage uh, as well uh, the, the, the youth as well. And uh, yes, so the, the key is uh, to, to have uh, technology in our, in, our con in our continent in order to ensure food. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Augustine. Uh, perhaps uh, another person has uh, has a question. 
um, I can see that uh, there is uh, a question uh, from uh, Miss uh, uh, Takudzwa uh, Chitupa. She is uh, from uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, Mr. Uh, Miss uh, Takudzwa, uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Takudzwa, can you unmute yourself, please, and ask your question directly? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can, clearly. Okay, my name is Takudzwa Chitupa from Zimbabwe. And my question is, are the youth properly equipped with the right knowledge and enough capital that enable them to practice sustainable food production? Uh, from my, my research, I have seen that there is actually a, a system whereby land is actually charged quite high prices. And for example, in Zimbabwe, it's actually so hard, even with the man to access land. So for youth, I think there are harsh conditions for them to enter into the agricultural space and waste still sustainable agricultural practices. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takutswa. Perhaps uh, one of the uh, panelists uh, would like to answer uh, this question. Uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Blaine, can you answer this question, please? Thank you. Sure. So I'll answer this question more from uh, a production and entrepreneurial standpoint and maybe a little less agricultural, but I think probably some of the challenges are quite similar to what you're saying in that generally youth across Africa do face a lack of access to knowledge and, and capital. And it's, it's a huge problem. And that's why earlier on I mentioned that, you know, government and funders are, are desperately needed to, to be on board and support um, in making change in food systems. Um, money is an important element of, of making this kind of change. However, that said, I do think an important part of, of doing this work is having an entrepreneurial mindset. And that often means starting small and pushing through when things are not easy. Um, so I, I think it's helpful if um, young entrepreneurs, whether that's you know in any kind of production business, a tech business, or agriculture, they have an idea, start small, and stay connected to your passion and, and why you do the work that you do. Um, and that's gonna have to be a driving force in a situation in which all the odds are stacked against you. Um, I think another important element is having that um, desire to ask for help, to learn new things, to um, seek out programs. And there's a lot of work that NGOs, funders, and governments need to do to make information and funding accessible. But on the other side, um, as much as, as folks can, they, they also have to really push themselves and put themselves out there um, and, and ask for help, look, you know, talk to people who've done it before them. And I know that's not easy uh, to say, especially if we're talking about folks living in a rural context who might not have had access to you know, plenty of resources or a strong network, but I think it's kind of this balance and that's not really a helpful situation. I mean, I think the short answer is no, they're not equipped, um, but like all of us in Africa have never been fully equipped for what we need to do. We just have to push on despite the challenges. And, you know, if you are in a place of power of any sort, whether you're an activist or involved in policy or in the private sector, you have an opportunity to give back, to support and help pull up 
all these you know young people seeking to make a difference so so i think that would be my answer hopefully that helps you both. thank you so much uh miss blaine tasfay for your uh for your brilliant uh answer uh, so now perhaps we have uh, another uh, question from any of our um, participants. Uh, yes, we have uh, from uh, Wellington uh, Madumira from uh, Zimbabwe um, saying that uh, there is a need to merge uh, entrepreneurship and food security. And do you think that uh, the youth uh, um, sorry. Um, okay. So um, okay. So uh, we have. Um, uh, yes. So um, Mr. Um, um, Mr. Wellington uh, Madumira, please can you ask uh, straight your question and unmute yourself? Thank you very much. Madumira, please, can you ask your question, please, and mute yourself? Hello? Are you able to hear us or not? Mm, I think... Um, Madumira perhaps uh, has some technical issues, so uh, I'm going to read uh, its uh, question. So um, the question is, um, are youth really interested in farming? Uh, because saying that our current youth are interested with uh, something that gives quick money. So that's its uh, question, perhaps uh, one of uh, our uh, panelists um, would like to answer to this question, please. Um, perhaps uh, Miss Elizabeth would like to answer to this question, please. Or any comments? Thank, oh, thank you so much for the platform. Uh, though i'm really not seeing the question but i think you said uh young people really interested with farming uh because they are in need of quick money but i think i'll just combine this question with uh, doreen from kenya who is also talking about less or similar the same um she says that um i think the environment for practicing agribusiness is in most African countries is not favorable for young people who can only access a little capital to start, let alone access to capital, comment a little bit about the middlemen that dominate agricultural markets, products, they determine prices, which, which most of the time do not favor ordinary farmers. Then again, access to quality seeds and fertilizers. I think there's still a lot of mentoring that young people really need to, really need for production of quality produce that can also compete adequately. So these two questions, one is saying, young people are not interested in farming. And uh, Diana is saying the conditions, you know, within the farming sector, you know, does not really suit young people. So this is the thing, young people, we need to understand that, you know, I, I talked about labor intensive, how, how labor intensive farming is. And most of our young people, we are modern, we are not used to it. And to be honest, people really love to be sitting also in an office, uh, wearing a tie, you know, wearing the high heels, ETC. That is good, fair and fine. But I would want to encourage our young people that are here that we can make agriculture cool. It doesn't mean that for you to be in the agriculture space, you only have to be in the field. There is a lot of jobs within the agriculture value chain. It's either you can choose to be a farmer, you can choose to focus on technology, you can choose to focus on policy. There is a whole lot of opportunities for young people to, 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 to occupy. There is a lot of spaces for young people in the agriculture, in the agriculture value chain. 
and um it's true that uh, you know we want fast we want fast things i mean some people are actually making money fast money through you know creating an application during the covid era because people could because of the lockdown people were bad to go to to the shops to buy basic commodities and someone just came and you know made an application and started delivering you know food services to people you know you can actually make quick money through that so there are a lot of options for us young people and on issues to do with you know um supporting young people having access to to agricultural finance that is a problem everywhere that is a problem everywhere but sometimes we need to take a seat and think that okay what really do we need is it money that we need is it technical capacity that we need or is it some sort of support or is it uh, do we have access to markets because sometimes our problems are not money related though i do agree that you know when it comes to access to agriculture finance it's a bit tricky sometimes we ask for collateral we don't even have collateral because we are young people and issues to do with land rights we don't even have access to land at times but it cannot it should not stop us to practice farming if we are interested to. Here in Zimbabwe, young people are actually renting. They are renting farms, they are renting land, you know, in order for them to make a living, in order for them to sustain their families. So there is always a way. Where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth, for your uh, insightful uh, remarks and, uh, and comment. And uh, uh, now, um, um, uh, please, uh, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Diana uh, to, to ask again uh, her question. Please, uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Diana Doreen from Kenya. Can Hello. you unmute yourself? Yes, go ahead. Uh, actually, what the pan the speaker has has already answered my question. I guess I was just looking at it on in one direction, the aspect of going to the farm and you know doing all the work. But I have just seen that there is more to it than that. There is the modern technology that allows farmers to access market i didn't really <laughs> look into so much of that but i guess she has already answered my question adequately but then how can can she please um comment a little bit on on the policies that maybe the policies that are in place do you think um it is favorable for young people do you think um th because for most 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 of the times it's always uh we young people are usually criticized so much about not looking into agriculture or the value chain as she has put it but when you look at the policies that are in place um most young people don't really understand and what is what is being done in africa to ensure that young people understand uh, how they can navigate through these policies that are in place. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Diana. Perhaps uh, Mr. Uh, Herman would like to answer to this question. Mr. Herman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I will. I will answer very briefly. Is Young people yes, are sure. not even aware of the existence of this policy. I read some evidence paper in the week, and these people highlight that policy exists, mechanisms exist sometimes, but people that should benefit from that policy and mechanisms are not aware. So the first thing is to ensure that when a policy is designed, we disseminate that policy at even to the last mile of the beneficiary that are targeted. 
if I take example of ECOAS, when you look at, for example, uh, I, will, I, I will build on the middleman person that determines the price in the value chain. When you look at the cross-border trades of agricultural products in the region, and you look at the official data provided by government and com trades, it looks like the region does not exchange. Country in the region does not exchange, but this is not true. Sales recently published something on informal cross-border trades. And for example, over the last year, the five last year, the average amount of informal cross-border trades among ECOWAS country is half billion per year. This is just the amount of product sales. When you consider that most of these people are young people, women that do that do not know that agricultural product in the region should not be taxed with tax. So they they pay informal tax to middlemen. This have incidents on on the price, the final price to consumer and even the price to them. So the the issue is we the the national the states the state actors do not disseminate enough the policy. Yes, the policy is in place, everyone applauds, but it's up there. So apart from the policy makers, the youth network that exists today is the main place that young people can get good information about the activity. There are so many rich information in that forum. And if you take time to involve yourself, you will learn more. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Herman Tosu, for your uh, answer. Uh, and now I would like to um, ask uh, the uh, closing uh, question. And I would like to remind our dear speakers and uh, dear participants that uh, we have only uh, two minutes in order to uh, answer to this question. So uh, the question would be, uh, what can our young members do to make a positive impact on the global food system and planetary health? Thank you so much. And uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Uh, Blaine uh, would like to answer to this question. Please, Ms. Blaine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ms. Blaine, are you with us? I think uh, I think we lost her, or so. Um... Okay, so I think uh, perhaps Miss Elizabeth would like to answer to this question, please. Miss Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what can our young members? Okay, I lost the question. But anyway, I think uh, the question was saying uh, what our young members, okay, to make a positive impact on the global food system and planetary health. So I think it is important for our young people to be well versed on issues to do with policy. I know um, Herman uh, explained a bit about policy, how young people should be part of policy implementation. I've been part of uh, policy formulation for the past three years. We need to understand that we cannot start advocating for young people to be part of the implementation process if we do not contribute into policy formulation. That would be difficult because already when the policies were being created or when the policies was being uh, formulated, uh, there is a certain group that was not part of it and there's a certain group that did not advocate for you know for what they need or what they deem is what they think is fit for for for, for sustainability 
So it becomes so difficult. So I would want to encourage young people not to say, uh, well, issues to do with policy, I think those are issues to do with the government. We now need to take things in our own hands. Whenever you hear the government saying we are coming up with an agricultural policy on this, this and that, you need to take interest. Don't think the government is going to invite you. Look for the draft policy, draft your intervention and submit it to them. Go to their offices and ask them that we, I think you need to incorporate young people uh, on when it comes to agriculture entrepreneurship. You need to incorporate young people when it comes to access of land. You need to incorporate young people when it comes to A, B, C, D, E. Then when it comes to implementation, it becomes easy because our voices have been heard and they've been incorporated into the policies. So this is how we can only get to start by making sure that our young people are part of policy formulation, which will make it easy for implementation. And if we have robust policies, it also means that even the projects that we are going to be that we are going to implement on the ground, they could be sustainable. And if they are sustainable, it means more money that is coming in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Elizabeth, for your um, comment. And uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Augustine would like to answer to this question. Please, Mr. Augustine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, globally, young people account for approximately 24% of the working poor particularly in Africa. So it's about time for young people to reflect about giving their lives meaning. The solution to them becoming prosperous is not in promoting urbanization, moving just to be in the capital city without having anything of value to do. The answer to giving their lives meaning is not to migrate to other African countries through the Mediterranean Sea. But the answer is in them making a personal reflection and then taking up the resolve to take up the responsibility as sailors of their own life's ship. And so therefore, they have to look at the vast opportunities and build resilience along the line because the challenges are there but you just have to build resilience. I hailed from the capital city in Sierra Leone. I was first schooled as a priest, and later I was schooled and trained as a lawyer. But I saw the opportunities in the agricultural sector, and so I decided to leave all of those fancies and then pursue something that can give my life meaning, that can help my family and others in society. I saw the huge potential in the agricultural sector, despite the challenge. And so I left the capital city to live in one of the provincial areas. And today I'm thriving. From a company that started in 2019 with just five employees, to now having 17 young people, most of whom are young university graduates and current university students that are able to support themselves to gain higher education through what they get at the end of the day. Today, we started from 2019 with supporting 50 farmers, so now working with 350 farmers. So when you build resilience, when you remain focused, when you remain consistent, when you remain committed to achieving, making a way for your life to be successful, there is nothing that can stop you to reach in that peak. There may be challenges along the line, but once you build resilience, you can always be the best that you can be. And we hope along all of these things that governments continue to provide a fair political will so that young people can thrive with their very innovative ideas in order for us to promote sustainable food transformation system that can impact the environment positively and that can impact human health positively. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Augustine, uh, for, for these uh, comments. Um, and now uh, I will ask, um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman, please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I will not 
repeat what the previous speaker already said. Just three or four recommendations. The first is full system summit is coming. So let's ensure that Yalda members get voice, their the voice heard during that summit. Second thing is to build network with private sectors, not only donors and leaders, but private sectors. Third is to ensure that our action do not target only graduate people, but also those who never go to school, but have something to bring and continue to bring something to the system. And the last is to ensure or to make efforts to get program designed by our member and implemented by our member to the benefit of the member itself, but also to uh, population at ground level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Herman, for your thoughts and for the comment. So uh, today that uh, we learned that um, in order to, um, to have a um, sustainable uh, food uh, system and uh, in our uh, continent, uh, we need uh, to encourage uh, the youth and uh, the youth uh, should not uh, migrate into other countries, but instead have to uh, develop uh, their homelands. Uh, we learned as well that uh, the implementation of technology is, uh, is very important um, in, or, in order to have a prosperous uh, Africa. Uh, we learned as well that, um, as well that um, we, uh, we have to ensure uh, our action uh, to uh, the people who goes, uh, to the people who go uh, to school. And uh, so, yes, so thank you very much, uh, our uh, dear um, panelists, uh, for joining us. And thank you, um, our dear um, audience, uh, for joining us. And um, uh, I would like, um, I would like to uh, say that uh, please uh, do follow us on our social uh, medias, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, in order to uh, to get the last uh, update and in, in order to register to uh, our upcoming webinars. So uh, I would like to thank as well the organizers of, uh, of these uh, webinars. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and thank you so much our dear panelists for having uh, shared uh, your knowledge. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy your rest of the week. Thank you so much.